This is Rocky Snyder. At the tone, leave your name and message and I'll get back to you. Once more, the Sith will rule the galaxy. And we shall... Welcome to the Rockford Files. I'm Rocky Snyder. We're, yeah, well into the fourth season. I say well, but this is episode two. And if you didn't listen last week, we had Gary Ward on the show, who is the founder of Anatomy and Motion and the creator of the Flow Motion model, which is a way of understanding how every joint in the body moves through three dimensional space in the course of the entire gait cycle. And we use that as a map in which we overlay many different professions to help us guide our clients, our patients, the people that see us with a, a, a much more effective manner, a much more powerful approach. Now, Gary has been working side by side with my next guest, who's Chris Sreetherin. And Chris <laughs> has been, not bad, huh? I pronounced it pretty well. I've been pronouncing it all different ways since we met. So now I think I've got it down. Chris, hey, welcome. Welcome to the Rockfit Files. Thank you. Good seeing you. You too. Now, you and Gary, you've been teaching anatomy and motion workshops since, was it 2012, 2010? When did you begin? 2012. With? So I met him on a course. So I did his course 2011. And then we started teaching together. Where I started assisting in the classroom 2012. We started actually teaching together 2013-ish. So quickly, I just want to know, how did you get to, to the workshop, to the course? What, what led you there? Um, so my background is a personal trainer, still am technically. Um, I was two parts to my business. I was actually personal training. And the second part, I was working in an education company. So we were training trainers, which was great. And um, I, my brain likes to know how things work. So for a period of time through my career up to that point, I was looking for, you know, you're always reading opposing ideas, don't you? On nutrition, this is good, this is bad, this is good, this is bad. And then you read one book that says they're both good and bad, depending on who you give it to. Um, same thing for the mind. And I couldn't find anyone doing anything uh, kind of real uh, with the physical body, with movement. And a colleague of mine at the time said, you should check out this guy, Gary Ward, went on his course and loved it, loved the way that he spoke about things, enjoyed his philosophy, which was very old. Um, and I just wanted to go see what he was about. I didn't know anything. There was nothing to see other than a few YouTube clips. But oh, you said old philosophy there. What do you mean by old? It's old. Like he, when you start looking at the body heals itself, not new. When you start looking at things finding center, not new. They're, they're you know, when you're looking at polarized ideas, finding an equilibrated state, you can track those back philosophically for thousands of years. Um, so old, he was speaking nothing new or nuanced. It was old. <laughs> so to me, he goes, right, so he's not uh, uh, trying to reinvent the wheel here. So that, that really is what drew me to him. Um, and I was very fortunate. I had great teachers behind me. Um, my kind of area of interest was postural correction. So we were already working in 3D, 3D stretches, foam rolling, looking at postural distortions in 3D and none of it moving, but to be able to, to develop a mind to see uh, changes in three dimensions. So when I met him and I looked at the model, it was great. It was just, went, oh, that, that's that. We've been looking at that for five years, but now we know what that is in the context of the foot. Oh, that's that, that's that. And so the part of the reason why I enjoyed the course so much is existing bodies of knowledge fit plugs directly into the model. You weren't, there wasn't somebody going, no, actually this doesn't do that. There, you know, it's a few elements of that, but the bulk of the mechanics fit together. And so my first impression was, wow, actually this is the first person I've ever seen that's actually put something together 
that is genuinely logical. Um, so that I tend to sit and enjoy things like that. And then a year later, we started working together. Um, and now we're here. Wow. Now, it, you were doing work teaching other trainers. And a year later, after taking the course, you did you just jump ship from there and switch completely over to assisting Gary at the workshops? How did that work? Yeah, so... Um... He had, at the time, the old format was four modules. So I was taking these modules during while I was working and training and so on. And we were teaching postural correctional courses. And it was great. Like I had a year where I must have marked 500 case studies of this old static postural assessment while learning this stuff. So I just spent a year cross-referencing information. And at some point, there's a turning point in your career, isn't there? And I, I was fortunate enough to have already been in education i've always worked in operations type roles in gyms i've got a very operation i like processes uh he needed somebody in the business who enjoyed processes <laughs> and um there was a there was a definite moment of you either go down this route or stay as you are but the two can't go together i couldn't have stayed in the old static world having now studied this I couldn't have stayed in the old protocol world having now studied this. Not to say this side was wrong, but actually there was an element where I just needed to turn right for a decade <laughs> and see what's down if I turn right and eventually start bringing this all back together. So it was like a, a 10 year immersion, if, if that makes sense. So, sure. Yeah, I never ditched the old stuff. I, it's the foundations of everything that I know. Um, but to, I've always enjoyed immersing myself in something learning it so that you can finally you know that old thing you don't break the rules until you understand what you're doing type of thing and then finally starting to come back to the old bodies of work and start bringing them all back together again and knowing where one is useful one is not where this is appropriate and this isn't recognizing that it's all part of the same thing so yeah i had to change i had to change for my mind more than anything it's not because i thought the other thing was wrong I just needed to turn right for a bit. <laughs> yeah. That makes sense. So with everybody else that has taken these courses, myself included, there were, there were epiphanies. There were moments that uh, I wouldn't even say a light bulb as much as a lighthouse beacon almost. You know, the blast of awareness came through when starting to unpack all of this information through the modules or in some people's cases, the six day immersion, however it was rolled out. When you were going through it initially, I'm curious, because I don't think we've ever spoken about this, but what, what were your epiphanies? I imagine you had a couple, and we've talked about, you know, you wanted to disprove the model and you've been doing that ever since, but yeah. what, what was it? What, do you, can you recall any of those times? Um, it's a good question. I think it's been so long. I still have them today. I, you know, given what I've been doing for the last nine years, 10 years, um, I still have them today. I still have moments of, oh my gosh. But they, I, they were more profound moments. There's a friend of mine, he says, you know that you've, you've bumped into something deeply profound because you're slightly embarrassed afterwards. <laughs> and I think it's true when you start entering kind of this first principle world and you go how did I not see that before um but I don't know I don't think I had them while I was studying the course if I'm honest because the mechanics weren't new they didn't uh, they didn't take me off guard I learned a lot about the foot which was brilliant um the, the epiphanies started more when I was uh, assisting and then more so teaching and I was really lucky you know I got to sit and listen to him lecture for six months probably about six months just making notes not on what he was saying but patterns because I, I tend to see the world like that and so I'd be writing or demonstrating to something to a student and I'd be drawing out all these patterns in books which I still have somewhere and it was those moments those certain relationships that I saw it's partly one of the reasons why I think the model is correct because 
if the model was, let's call it, was incorrect structurally or was 0.1 seconds out, let's just say, those relationships wouldn't be there to be seen. If that makes For sense. For instance, give, can you give an example? Um, so, I just want to give you a useful one that kind of remains in the context of what we're doing. Um, if you, sorry, Matt, I'm just trying to make sure I can give you one that isn't going to be off topic. Sure. <laughs> that makes sense. Um, so if you look at a, a heel, take a heel, for example, a calcaneus, and when you learn from the lower body workshop, and we've always learned, you know, the, the calcaneus plantar flexes in, in, in the footprint. But if you change the word to plantar flex and you call it an anterior tilt, then you get to see at that moment in time where there's this cog on top of the body, which all of a sudden that heel seems to be following uh, other structures. And it's consistent through the model. Um, and it was moments like that, which the timing element, if, if it was wrong, we shouldn't be able to see it. Now, either it's wrong, <laughs> it's just wrong in pure coincidence, or actually this model is correct. And the more and more I delve into trying to break it down, trying to break the mechanics, try to break the timings, try to go against the, uh, the, the, the anatomical movements, you can't crack it. I'm, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty confident it's right. There's gaps. Clearly, because that's the human body. There's always going to be gaps until we find out what fills them. But as an actual skeleton, <laughs> as a framework of movement, it's, it's right. And it was those moments. And they, it, it wasn't an epiphany about the body. It was, it, was a, it, was, it was the remarkable moment of a discovery. Mm. That, that, if that makes sense. Like, I love anatomy but it, it doesn't consume my life. Like I like how things move. I like how things work. I like reading into, similar to you, history of how things came about. Yeah. And this feels like we are doing something like that. So really um, a moment of awareness, right? Like the, the information was already out there, but you became aware of it. Yeah, yeah. And what's amazing is when I then cross-reference some of it, not all of it, but some of it to things that were alluded to or mentioned or tried to have been described in, let's say, Chinese medicine. There were similar observations, maybe not from the skeleton, but similar observations in the body. And so I think what this, what flow motion model gives us an opportunity to do above and beyond everything is an in-depth study of the skeleton while it's moving. which I think will add a, a tremendous amount of work to an already very large body of work. You know, we've got a lot of, it's not just, you know, chiropractic, osteopathy, very skeletal based, uh, huge depths of what the anatomy does, but to actually see what a skeleton does from a footstep to a footstep and have a, a, a map that goes with it, which is fairly consistent with, the majority of humans we've met, um, I think is a wonderful step forward for whatever the future holds for body work and education uh, around a physical body. Um, so yeah, it was the discoveries more than an epiphanies of how to work, yeah. Well, it, yeah. it really ruined my personal training career, I'll tell you that, <laughs> in, in a way that I, I was just, I was happy being ignorant in some ways where you just count to 10, you hand somebody a weight and you give them these movements that we've been taught before and over time for decades and decades. And now, now I know something else and that is changing everything that I do. So, wow. you know, it's, it, I, I say that with some sarcasm of sh for sure, because I love what I do now, but you yourself said, well, I'm a personal trainer by, 
you know, officially still, but that's really not what you are. You, you uh, have that certificate on the wall, but what is it that you do? Because aside from teaching these courses online and in person, when, when those times come around again, you'll be doing that once more, but what, what is it that you're doing? Not what are you, because we don't have to put a label to it. Can you describe when people come to see you, because there are still people seeing you in the clinic, what, what is it that they're coming? Who are the people that are seeing you and what do you do? Well, I think the best way that I describe me is, uh, my, whenever I send an invoice, it says movement investigation. <laughs> that's on the invoice. Um, because that's my interest. And I don't uh, try and hide that really. Uh, I, I didn't get into the industry necessarily to help people. Uh, maybe to some degree I did, but my interest is, is just the body. You know, your pain is your problem. <laughs> but if you want someone to have a look at it, I'll, I'll do that. Yeah. Um, but it, so everyone that comes in, I want to investigate what's going on. I'm definitely more interested in how it came about. And because I like how systems work, I, I have a movement background, so I have a personal training background, I have a corrective exercise background. Uh, I studied cranial sacral therapy because I started seeing more head stuff and I needed to get some skills to understand more about what I was seeing. I fell in love with the body of work, so I started doing it. Um, and I call it an investigation because I'm trying to find the source of this problem. And if I look at what, what does every therapy have in common, whether it's talking therapy to a physical type thing, to all trying to take pressure off the system, um, I know I can't do that. And you can only work the way that you want to be worked with, you know, treat people the way you want to be treated. And I have a very particular way that I like to work in my life. I don't like people doing things for me. I would, I'm happy to sit with a problem for a year. I like to investigate so I know what's going on. Um, and so I do my best to do that with people that I work with. Um, some people love it. Some people hate it. I would, you know, I, I don't want to sit and make that sound like it's, it's incredibly busy because it's not. There's very few people that, uh, like I think that like the way that I work uh, it's definitely not for everybody um, so we'll go in we'll investigate we'll take the history we'll get a story we we'll try and build a, a, a mechanical blueprint as to where this potentially started where are you where are you not like I love simple language it's what I've always brought into the check-ins where are you where are you not uh, because I think we can relate to that in physical space and if I can help them become aware of what they do do and don't do, which is not that easy as you know, I think that's probably 80% of the, the task done. Because we don't have, or I don't have manual skills like an osteo or chiropractor, I can't do that sort of intervention. So it has to be very passive on my part and active on their part, which same as you. And the only way to help somebody do something for themselves is to teach them rules give them a framework and let them know that you're going to get it wrong. You're just going to get it wrong until you get it right. And the more times you get it wrong, the more probability of getting it right is we'll start ticking off not that way, not that way, not that way, not that way. And eventually you'll get there. And I think it's true. You know, you said it earlier on this call and I said it to a guy the other day, the difference between being okay and not okay is a, is, is, is a millimeter. The, the difference between feeling great today and awful is a millimeter. And it's a game of millimeters. We use large, big movements. In some instances, I, as you know, I, <laughs> I definitely don't work like that. But um, how do I, I, I want people, what, I want to work with people the way that I like to work with me. And I like working with me by just quietly exploring my body and paying attention to what it's doing learning from it, developing a relationship with it, working with it, not on it. And that's just a slow, steady, gentle process. And that's really what I brought into with the check-ins. That, that was what I was trying to instill, hopefully, people to 
be able to assess one yes but two do something with your body hopefully in a different way um bodies are quite abstract people think they have a good relationship with them but we don't really like you can say you know your knee but do you you seen inside it because if the answer is no how well can we know this thing it's like saying you know what's inside the house when you've never been in there so the things that i know about inside my body are because of books or videos so i'm taking this external information and thinking that's the same as my internal stuff and when i started to see that more and more in clinic i was like wow okay this is yeah we have to help you develop a relationship with your body and i don't mean that in a woo woo sense or a wishy washy sense like this is your hand this is how your hand works when was the last time you actually looked at it <laughs> <laughs> we're kind of in that that space and I, I i really hope that doesn't come across as condescending but the way that i choose to work that's one of the biggest skills that i can hopefully pass on to people which is actually i really want to pay attention to what my body does and where am i in it and where am i not um i i honestly i i endear myself to to those check-ins and for the listening audience when chris speaks of checking in with the body we're talking about you know, how do, how do the joints move? How do the bones move? Among other things. But we might look at where is the pressure at the base of your feet? Is it different than one foot than the other? Really, or, or if you can't understand where the pressure is, where isn't there pressure? So what can you do? What can't you do? And then maybe moving up to the ankles and understanding if, if their positions, is it the same on each side? And the, the knees, of course, the hips and pelvis. How do you move through your pelvis, this bony structure? Can it tilt forward and can it tilt back? Can it translate off to one side as evenly and in an identical fashion as it goes to the other side or rotate this way or that way? These are the check-ins that can really bring about a tremendous amount of insight and information to the people that are using the flow motion model to, to help individuals just move better, to take away potential pain if that's the goal, or just to improve themselves and their efficiency. I int I'm interested, or I kind of giggle inside my head, Chris, at some things you just said, because I thought that, uh, I, I just chalked it up to my own kind of callousness that yes, we're personal trainers by trade in a way, and people are coming for help, but I'm not really interested in helping people. In, in that regard, I mean, it, it sounds, again, it sounds callous and sensitive, I, and I care. And if people come in with, with pain and they're seeing me and I can help them get out of it, great. That's going to be a good thing. But intrinsically, if for me, I'm much more interested in the puzzle as to why did this happen? What is their history? I love doing crossword puzzles. And, if so, you know, if somebody came in with an automaton, that wasn't actually human and was moving in such a fashion, I would still do it the same way. So yeah. it, it doesn't remove the, the personal side of life, but I got to right. say that that's, that's actually not how I look at people when they come in. Yeah. It's not makes us less caring. It's just, it takes, it, it, it just, um, it's a different lens, I guess I'm saying. Yeah, I think it's great. I love that people want to dedicate their lives to help people. I love that there are people like that in the world. Yeah, that's not um, me. <laughs> no, but do I help a lot of people? I think so. Uh, yeah. Is it what I want to dedicate my life to? Not really. The investigation is, the study of yeah. movement and anatomy and this thing that I live in is for sure. And if I can share or share, I think I don't want to use the word pass on, but certainly share some of the things that I've learned along the way. And if they're useful for people, then great. <laughs> now, some of the things you've learned along the way in the last, say, 10, eight to 10 years, you know, go beyond what we want to talk about right now. But you mentioned joint relationships, like when the, the heel, the calcaneus, will roll forward. We can say plantar flexing or anteriorly tilting. There are other things that are going in the same direction or in, in gait and so on. But are there other things that you could share that made you go, oh, wow, I never saw that. I never looked at it that way. Or, or just one of those things where you're going, wow, there's a pattern that I hadn't even considered. Yeah, I mean, there's, there, there are heaps of them. Um, 
I was chatting to a friend yesterday. I went to see them over the weekend, and none of the truth. I mean, genuinely, for this this conversation, none of it would be useful, <laughs> uh, or in, even it, even remotely interesting. I don't think because they're all dependent on knowing the model. But yeah, there have been some the most remarkable things. I remember documenting the jaw in three D, um, which was lovely. It was lovely to see just wow look at that what that jaw done and all of a sudden people coming through the door and you know they've got these dental issues or tmd or whatever it is called but there's no history of trauma to the jaw and you go well what if it's responding to something else and to be able to take that level of inquiry which i think is quite a rational approach a very logical approach to things go have you had a knock on it? No. Okay, so it's in the wrong place and nothing's fit it. No. It's like me waking up in the morning and my car's moved and I didn't move it. <laughs> so <laughs> how did that happen? And it, it starts the inquiry. Um, so there was heat, there's heaps of them. Um, but I, I, I think that the majority of them will be meaningless to some degree. But yeah, I, I, I yeah, it does that to my face. <laughs> <laughs> um, looking, looking at, just scanning my head for the ones that I could possibly share. Um, the first time that I was able to see the, uh, the SIJ moving in 3D and to put together its actual relationship and influence on the structure was was remarkable for me, I think. Well, you, um, stu you studied animal motion for a long time. You, you were just one of your side kind of projects of, of yeah. understanding movement, right? Was, was looking at how animals move. So I'm curious, knowing these quadrupedal actions of the animal motion, say a dog, a cat, a cheetah, whatnot, and then overlaying that onto a contralateral biped, a human form on two feet, what, what was it that, you know, you must have found some curiosity overlaying the two. What, can you yeah. talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I, I think there's, okay, so <laughs> you know, we often talk about, um, we are contralateral movers, you know, one on one leg, and we work through the transverse plane. But what's interesting is when you, and this is all on the assumption that this model is correct. If this is correct, if you look at the timing of it, we don't move as contralaterally as we think we do. So arm swing is slightly out of sync with leg swing. Is that what you're referring to? Or is there more? Yeah, there is periods of time where the structures are moving all in the same direction. So you're, move, you're almost moving ipsilaterally. And I find that very interesting because it's very true for quadruped animals. They don't walk contralaterally completely, do they? The time... And you start watching the timing differences. You go, they're not left hand, right foot, right hand, left foot, left hand, right foot. They're not like that. They, they don't walk robotically. There's this rhythm to them. And that rhythm to them actually breaks that contralateral idea through timing. So can we observe it that way? Yes. But actually, when you start to break its movement down, there are elements where it's ipsy. And I, I like that. Um, I like that a lot because it makes us think about things differently. It had, it had to be that way. We, we've kept, from what I can see, and again, assuming the model's correct, we still have the same uh, timing as being on all fours. And I say as being on all fours, like it's assumptions that we were, but you can still, whether we were or weren't, it doesn't matter. We can still see the same sequencing taking place um, and I think that's very interesting yeah now you're speaking of as, assuming the model is correct that's the flow motion model and how every joint moves in the gait cycle 
uh, through three-dimensional space in the course of 0 0.6 to 0 0.85 seconds, right? This is, this is what we're talking about, the flow motion model. And you have been trying to disprove that model in order to understand if it's really accurate, if it's true. And you've been doing that now for, oh, close to 10 years, I imagine. And yeah, so since 2011, yeah, so nine years. Yeah. And thus far, um, any hiccups? Um, there is a, just one or two things that we are talking about, but on the whole, I can't, I can't break it. Like, honestly, I've tried. Like, the reason for it was this. So I, I, I live you know, in a very simple world, uh, and I've been really fortunate to really enjoy kind of Taoist philosophy and that, that element of the world. So I went, if this is so good, it must be so bad. Let me go find the so bad. <laughs> so I, I went looking and I needed to because I also knew that it was so good that it would be easy to follow blindly. And I tend not to enjoy doing that. So I went, oh, I'll go see if I can break this thing. And I, I've always enjoyed taking things apart, even as a kid, I just to give everything apart. Um, and so I've tried. I've tried to break things down. Truthfully, it was one of my biggest, biggest learning curves because I was able to answer certain questions. There are elements that you'll still hear today. We'll probably hear the same conversation in 20 years' time, certain people saying certain things about what's the leg doing at the back. And we can have this hypothetical question or we can have a very structural-based question. And so trying to pull the model apart led me into thinking about things far more structurally because I couldn't rely on the hypothetical answer because I didn't know if the model was right. So you've got this model, you go, it could be right or wrong. I need something more concrete. The anatomy has been pretty solid for a good 400 some years. So let's use that. So I referenced the actual anatomy against the model rather than the other way around. And I'm still doing it. Yeah, I'll, I won't stop. <laughs> I won't stop. Just for that one day, I can go to him and see I told you. <laughs> <laughs> I, now, um, go ahead. Yeah, and I think it's important. Right? I, I think it's important for us as an education company to, it's partly why we formed our relationship the way that we have. And um, you'll see, you know, I, I don't really have any big affiliations with AIM. You don't see me have a major uh, uh, social media presence or, I don't advertise myself with it. And the reason for it was I needed, and I've said this, you know, Gary and I have got a very clear understanding. I needed to be on the outside being able to work really objectively so that there's somebody dedicated to trying to see if this is accurate or not. Mm. And, you know, I love science and I love the history of science and I love the idea that we're walking the line that is consistent with that level of authenticity. And so I wanted to disprove it, one, because I like doing things like that, but two, I felt like it's very important that someone's tried. So I've put in five figures worth of trying. I won't stop. And five figures of hours, sorry, worth of trying. And I'll always, every day I'll have a go somewhere even if it's with a generally now it's with clients clients will come in presenting something incredibly unusual and go ah uh, now i'm going to break this thing and gently find its way back and you can you can explain the aberrations and um i, I just think it's important yeah well i love the approach that i have learned from both of you but i must admit that i think i get more of it from you personally where it's the law, I keep coming back to the, the term logical progression. Like there is a, a logical procedure that you typically take when looking at the body. And it, uh, of course, comes to a, a, a duality kind of approach. Well, what is it trying to do? What is it incapable of doing? What is it capable of doing? I, it, can it go this way is it, or can it go this way? You know, there's this, if it can't, then what is what is further up the chain or down the chain that is taking more of that on or restricting that? You know, there's always, a, if this, then this. 
And if not this, then this. And it's almost like this trickle down flow chart, kind of like every time I see somebody, how I think of it is there are those kind of uh, games you'll find in the, in the Far East where you put a marble on top of a board that has hundreds and hundreds of nails that are, have been nailed into that <laughs> board. Yeah. And there is an there is an outcome at the bottom that is a wide range of potentials, and you can yeah. put marble at the top, and it hits one nail, and it can either go to the left or to the right, and then it hits another one, and it can go left or right, and no matter how many times you put the marble at the top of that board, it's going to give you an incredibly different outcome than the time before. Yeah. In fact, there's so many variations to it that you just don't know how it's going to end up, and I think that yeah. is logical process in which I can kind of, if there's an analogy, that's what I think of when somebody walks in, that's the marble on top of the board. And as soon yeah. as I get them to explore movement in one direction, they just hit the nail and I want to see which way yeah. they drop to. It's, it's a really interesting point because this is why I think it's important. So we have a model and we can go, actually, we can follow this thing fairly confidently. However, what can't we follow confidently? Injury. And I think that that pinboard analogy is a very good analogy because we tend to look for patterns. Our industry is veering towards teaching patterns and teaching protocols for patterns rather than extracting a logical process, which could be an, an infinite number of variables. So we know injury one meets you, injury one enters the body and we can say it's going to respond this way or that way. Let's just assume it, you know, you've got this untouched body and one injury enters and it's going to go this way or that way. You put injury two into that body at a different vector in a different location. And you've got these two things coming at each other. And what I've really enjoyed thinking about over the last few years is that it's a negotiation. So injury one enters the body, body, works figures it out and we can probably follow it second injury comes to a different vector and <laughs> so i was i've been teaching classes on zoom recently and I had a bit of a rant about like i hate the onion layer idea it doesn't really work like that does it i don't know why we use it but i like the idea of negotiation so you've got injury one that enters the system follow it injury two enters and this is negotiation and injury one does not get covered by injury two, hence the onion layer is a silly analogy. <laughs> they negotiate. Injury three enters, they negotiate. And that's not to say that your brain's you know, actually negotiating it, but as an idea, if you think about when you need to eat what you, what, what do you want for dinner? Why well, not? I'm gonna have burritos. <laughs> you bring somebody else in, what do you want for dinner? Now we have a discussion. You bring three people in, four people in, eight people in. Next thing you want to just go sit down and on a park bench and eat at McDonald's with none of those people around you because it's too many variables. Now, if you take a complex system like a body, insanely complex, where we don't even really know what it's do, doing or why it's doing it, you put two injuries in and that's hard enough. You start putting four, five, over 50 years layered compensatory patterns. So I have no, I can't read that. I can't read that. That that is no different in my mind than having a lake raining on it, trying to separate one circle from another. Which was the first one. I have no idea here. They are just literally overlapping and influencing each other at such a rate. And I think that analogy that you use is a brilliant idea because if I have a problem on my right shoulder, it's and I've damaged my right ankle, I can't say, yeah, there's a relationship between the right shoulder and the right ankle because I could have damaged my left ankle and still had a problem in my right shoulder for completely different reasons. All of a sudden that reasoning has just fallen. And so I think there's a bit a distinct difference between we can follow this. There are patterns here in an ordered environment, but the moment we chuck injury complexity, different vectors, different forces, different mindsets into this, I don't know how we go about teaching these patterns on an altered system. Um, so, yeah, I like it. <laughs> yeah. Now, the, the people that come, the students that, that emerge in these workshops come from so many different disciplines, from so many different modalities or professions. For instance, there are, you mentioned craniosacral workers. So 
you know, we consider that manual therapy. And within there, you've got different forms of body workers and massage therapists. You may also consider that with physical therapy. And we've had uh, chiropractors and osteopaths. There have been, of course, the movement specialists like personal trainers and, and physical therapists, but Pilates instructors and, and dance instructors. I think there was one person who was a voice coach and then medical doctors, as well as chiropractors and acupuncturists. I, I think I've pretty much hit almost everyone. There may be just uh, PE teachers or sport coaches perhaps, but out of all them, and not to throw any, but not to create a hierarchy in any sense, that's not what I'm, I'm asking in this question, is that out of all of those types of students or modalities, who, what category are the most accepting, the most uh, investigative, the, the, I won't even say the most successful students, because that's not what it is. Like, who are the ones that say, oh, this, this is really what I'm needing? And who are the ones that you, that, that struggle with the idea of this mm. full body orchestrated motion? Would, do, you, do you see any kind of pattern there? So, I mean, I think straight off the bat, it's difficult because it's always the individual and those like those sorts of individuals will go through all sorts of industries. Um, I don't think we've had people struggling with the full body idea in terms of acceptance. Is that what you mean in terms of acceptance? No, just like with the, with the coursework, the amount of information coming in, is it the, like the movement yeah. therapist or the manual therapist between movement and manual? Like they both bring in a wonderful compliment. Yeah. The manual therapist will understand the, the muscles as it relates to being on a table and maybe energetic systems, neurokinetic mm. therapy is what I'm thinking about. But then you've got the, the people that are movement based and the personal trainers and the Pilates instructors who understand a little bit more about joint function perhaps. And they will glom onto that, but struggle mm. with other aspects. But I'm wondering like the medical doctor, I guess that's where, that's where I'm curious too. If you've had a couple of medical doctors in there yeah. and, and their education was not about biomechanics or actually, yeah. strangely enough, human movement and kinetics. So, yeah. Yeah, just, okay. Um, so I think the ones that tend to grasp the movement very quickly is always the trainers. Um, and particularly ones that have spent time lifting free weights of some description i i think <laughs> and i think there's a natural carryover oddly because if you're lifting free weights you're generally trying to strengthen and sculpt a body of some description and you know i've encouraged all the students over the last 20 weeks to watch pumping iron watch pumping iron watch pumping iron because you get to see just how intelligent these bodybuilders were how in tune they were to uh the smallest rotation of a forearm to get more out of a bicep like just phenomenal but interestingly, that's exactly how we would work with the model. It's just mechanic. So I think that they tend to do very well with, with movement-based and very well with the tissue element. And because they've kind of shaped their mind to watch movement well, they just, they're generally very good all-rounders. They can make up any, let's kind of quote-unquote, deficit in anatomy. Gotcha. The therapists... Um, they do well. I mean, obviously, anatomically, they do incredibly well. If they've never had a movement background, that's what catches them the most. I think the difference between the movers and the, the manual therapists that haven't done much movement is more to do with the amount of time that they've invested in shaping their neurology to watch a body moving. That's what catches most people. It, you know, it's not an easy task to watch somebody move. And so I think the advantage of anyone that's studied movement in the background is not that they know movement better, it's just they're much more familiar with it. It's no different than knowing where you live. You're, you're never going to know as well as a local. And I think that's the gap. So hopefully what the manual therapists or the ones that are new to movement are realizing is the only way to get better at seeing movement is to watch movement more. You, you, there's no other way around it, is there? Um, you can't rely on, does that hurt? You go, let me just watch you move. And... I need to upgrade and upskill where I am in that environment. 
So I wouldn't say across the board we can make, there are, there are, I think the better generalists are the trainers. Better generalists are the trainers. I think they've had the bulk of their careers watching movement, watching for symmetry, watching for differences, coaching, pull that dumbbell back a bit, extend your thoracics a bit more during that. They're watching people's posture break down as they fail through reps. Like their, their minds are shaped much better to watch your body move. And it's just volume of time, I think, personally. Well, I will say from personal experience that my observation skills have improved tenfold since studying with you both because, well, you, you're knowing what to not expect, but you, you're understanding how the bone is shaped and therefore how the joint is going to move and what you should be seeing. And that expectation of, of ideal movement overlaid with what you're actually witnessing has, has uh, been a game changer for me because, and I think honestly only in the last say uh, year, six months to a year, has that really been the point? Partly because we are restricted in our ability to contact people and a lot of it's done virtually. So your observation yeah. skills have to be that much greater and yeah. it, as well as your verbal cueing skills to try and, and guide people into a place that they may not readily go. So it's, it's really fascinating how, yeah. how, how shelter in place has actually improved my observational skills. So yeah. interesting. And that ability to explain something really simply. Yes. That is, that, that's a great point. Expand on that if you, if, if you don't mind. Like the simplicity of, of coaching or guidance of, of a person that you work with. So I, uh, again, if I go all the way back to the beginning, I, I don't think the majority people, including us, you know, we're always getting to know our bodies, but we don't have that good of a grasp of them. We, we like to think we do. We can use them well. But it doesn't mean we really have a good sense of how they work. Similar to our car, I might be able to drive it well, but if you take that thing apart, I'm going to struggle putting it back together again. Um, so what I learned over time, and I'm sure you did, and I'm sure a lot of people did, is we one, we can't take in too much information. So number one, keep things to as few points as possible. Number two, I like that Pareto's law idea, you know, what 20% can I do to get 80% of the result? So I've got three cues to give you of which I need to get, try and achieve 80% of this outcome. So I need to pick them very carefully. And there's two elements to them. If you're looking for quite a gross shape through the body, I like the idea of it's trying to like putting a bed sheet on a bed. <laughs> I need to pin that corner, that corner, and that corner, and that one will take care of itself for a large movement. If you're looking for something more delicate in a knee, how do I break that into two or three very simple things that you can see? So while we've been teaching over this period, um, so I have like a I have a very strict head. I like to put things, not that I like to put things in boxes, but when I'm watching something to break it down, you have to grid things up. And I just thought everybody did that, but I have like a grid in my head. And so I started to introduce this idea of rectangles and corridors. Keep this inside that. Keep this inside that. Not in the traditional way of knee over second toe. But let's say we've got knee over second toe, but we've got the width of the foot, which means I've got this much play available to me. I don't want to be outside this corridor. I don't want to be outside on this side of the corridor. I want to be here. So I've introduced all of those elements. And so obviously what I tend to do with people is to show these are the corridor. I don't want it to go this way or that way. Stay inside it. And I, it's probably going to take 80% of the work out of the way. Um, so rather than telling them what to do, I do my best to give them the framework there's a guy that I used to work with and he was the guy uh, who originally taught me all my postural correction work. And I ended up teaching for him later. And I loved it. He was a sports therapist. And he said, uh, he goes, my job is just to put the bumpers up. And I said, what? Let's pretend they're a bowling alley. And my job is to put the bumpers up. So they just stay in the alley. And he was referring to their life. The idea was so clear with it, when you're studying martial arts or you're studying sports, there is a line of, of game. Anything outside of that is diminishing return type idea. 
So if I can give you a framework, keep your knee inside this window, I don't have to tell you to put your knee here. You're just going to, you'll get there by keeping it inside the window. And so I try to give them external markers to move their body inside because their internal markers weren't clearly defined enough yet. Mm. that makes sense so I, yeah. I always try and work that way and then you generally start to work back in again so I, I i started to avoid internal cueing i started to give far more external cueing wow very nice i like that idea well this has been a remarkable time i really appreciate it i know we're we're gone a little bit over but i had some technical glitches at the beginning of this podcast <laughs> So all things considered, uh, this has been phenomenal. I really appreciate your insight and, and of course, just the, the continued learning that I receive through the videos that you're putting out these days, the, the coursework that we can go to on the educational platform and rewatch countless times over and over. It's just, it's, it's just a wonderful gift that you and Gary both have afforded all of us. So, you know, thank you so much. And, yes. um, you know, I, I don't think that you're much of a social media butterfly. No. no. And, and I, <laughs> you know, I, I don't, and I don't think you're actually looking for clients or anything, but normally at the end of these podcasts, I ask, okay, so if anybody would like information on how to reach you, but I get this sense that you're like, no, just leave me the hell alone so I can do my yeah. own. <laughs> I don't have any see clients, but I'm like a sloth. I'll come down the tree every so often. I don't. I find you through anatomy and motion. Yeah, to my That's details are there. I've got a Facebook page, um, but I, I, I just don't have a social media presence or a website. Or yeah, it's always just been referral work, which is nice. Well, I, I appreciate your time. Brilliant. Thanks. Thank you. If you'd like to find out more information about the Flow Motion Model, Anatomy and Motion Courses, or Gary Ward himself, pick up a copy of his book, What the Foot, at findingcenter.co.uk. And while you're at it, pick up a copy of my book, Return to Center, where I take the Flow Motion Model and apply it to strength, training, and conditioning. You can get a copy of that at rockysnyder.com. Thanks for listening. <coughs>